How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome to probably the most requested video that I have ever had. Literally, ever. This is the Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver Professor Oak's Challenge. And yeah, I'm sure you've heard the legend of how hard this one is. Nearly 400 Pokemon, Pokegear phone calls for Evolution Stones, the Safari Zone, having to use the Pokegear for certain Pokemon, it's all true. However, I've spent over a year working on and off on this challenge, and I think it's about time that it's unleashed to the internet. This is the Professor Oak's challenge in Pokemon Heart Gold and Soul Silver. I'll be using Heart Gold version, and I won't be using the Pokewalker, since it's technically another game, quote unquote, and I'd rather not anything be construed as optional. Anyway, let's get right into it. So, if you're not familiar with the Professor Oak's challenge, let me describe it very simply, which is basically capture and evolve every single Pokemon possible before every single gym. So, with that in mind, I name myself Chaotic, and the first Pokemon we get is our starter, either Totodile, Chikorita, or Cyndaquil. Cyndaquil evolves into its final form at level 36, Chikorita at 32, or Totodile at 30, so it's smartest to get Totodile to reduce the time grinding. We also get the Poke Gear, a super important item that we'll need in order to get certain evolution items. So, the game is pretty standard, since we don't get Pokeballs until we retrieve the egg from Mr. Pokemon, fight our rival, and name him. After getting taught how to catch Pokemon, I'm able to grab a Hoot Hoot and Rattata on Route 29, since it's nighttime currently, so I can't get Pidgey and Sentret until the morning. Route 46 is also right up north of here, where I'm able to capture Geodude during the night. This led me to Route 30, allowing me to capture Spinarak, and Route 31, where I captured two Bell Sprouts, one of which I'll be using for a trade. The last area I can go to for the time being is Dark Cave, where I'm able to get a Zubat, which I'll be keeping in my party until it evolves at High Friendship, as well as a 1% Dunsparce, so I used the area as a training ground until I found one, taking about a half hour before moving into Violet City. However, this is where this challenge deviates from the normal Gold and Silver challenge. There's a guy here named Primo in the Pokemon Center. If you give him the right passwords, he'll reward you with some eggs. There's three of them, so I calculated the password using this website that I'll be leaving in the description for those of you who want to try out this challenge for yourself. I will admit that two of them are catchable in this section, but I'd rather not have to search for them if I don't have to. Luckily, it's still nighttime, so I was able to get my last nighttime encounter for the section, that being Ghastly in Sprout Tower. From there, I figured why not grind for a bit waiting until the morning, so I started with Totodile, which was pretty high level already, allowing me to evolve it at level 18 into Croconaw only a few minutes after grabbing Ghastly. The egg started to hatch while I was running around, getting Slugma, Wooper, and Mareep before finishing off the Croconaw, getting it to level 30 and evolving into Feraligator. I used the last few levels of it to switch train the three hatchlings since they were all at level 1 and not able to fend for themselves. But after it evolved, they were able to. The first of them I grinded was Marine, which I was able to grind up into Flaffy at level 15 fairly easily thanks to the fact that I had Thundershock, making taking down the Ghastlies in the tower a piece of cake. From there, I figured it was enough progress for a day, so I took a bit of sleep, waking up in the morning for the rest of the encounters. And yeah, that's basically how the challenge goes, making sure you strategize when you play and grind so that you can do as much as possible. I won't be specifying the extreme details for the rest of the challenge, since there's so much and this video would be two hours because of it, but I'll still tell you about exclusive Pokemon for time of day to make it easier for you, as well as the guide that's going to be left in the description. Shoutouts to Mulax for writing it. Getting back to the game, I went to the Ruins of Alf to solve a Kabuto puzzle so that I could capture a single unknown. Oh, the game gave me an F. I guess it respects me for doing this challenge, woohoo! If you're watching this in the premiere, make sure to leave an F in the chat for respect. And also hit that like and subscribe button. With that shameless plug out of the way, I went back over to Route 32, grabbing a Hopip since it's the only encounter left for me. Though Soul Silver players will need to get Ekans here. And with that, I figured I'd do some more grinding, since grinding in the Sprout Tower is only good at night since Ghastlies give the most EXP out of the whole available group of wild Pokemon for the section. It's a little worse in Soul Silver since Ekans is a bit of a pain to take down and pulls down the average amount of EXP you'll get on Route 32, so you're better off just grinding at night and taking the days off. After a few more hours of grinding in my whole party, 
Wooper finally got to level 20 and evolved into Quagsire. So I just kept plugging away, making it so that Geodude was the next to evolve, getting to Graveler at level 25 after another round of grinding. Flaffy followed up very quickly, evolving into Ampharos at level 30 after a few more minutes. After finishing that grinding session, when I returned to the Pokemon Center, I got my second Bellsprout and traded it for an Onix here in Violet City, returning back and switching it for the other Bellsprout that I need to train. I figured while I was at it that I should grab the remaining counters on other routes, so I grabbed Pidgey and Caterpie on Route 30, Centret on Route 29, and Spearow on Route 46 before going back to grinding. I will say that Hoppip is a pain in the butt to grind since it's not strong and only has Splash to start off with, though admittedly it did get better once it evolved into Skip Loom at level 18. Everything in this session is pretty high in terms of level evolutions. Outside of Caterpie, everything's over level 20, with some of them getting really high, such as Slugma at 38 and Pidgey at 36. It can get quite crazy and takes a long time, longer than most of the other games. I don't think I've ever taken more than 30 hours on the first section of a POC, even the crazy ones like Alpha Sapphire and XD, but this one was insane. In short, I evolved the rest of the Pokemon in those rounds of grinding, those being Bellsprout into Weepin' Bell at level 21, Hoot Hoot into Noctowl at level 20, Slugma into Micargo at level 38, Pidgey into Pidgeotto at level 18, Ghastly into Haunter at level 25, Skiploom into Jumpluff at level 28, Pidgeotto into Pidgeot at level 36, Zubat into Golbat at level 22, and into Crobat one level later, Spinarak into Ariados at level 22, Spearow into Firo at level 20, Raditza into Raticate at level 20, Caterpie into Metapod at level 7 and into Butterfree at level 10, and Sentret into Furred at level 15. I wanted to leave the low level stuff until the end, since I figured that it would feel like that I was progressing faster near the end, though I don't know exactly what would have been faster. And with a total of 41 Pokemon, or 43 in Soul Silver, and a time of 65 hours and 34 minutes, yeah, it's time to fight Faulkner. And yes, looking at the leaderboard, I admit it's pretty bad, but we again we have to consider that this was my second POC ever at the time of recording this, which was in May of 2019, so it's kind of cringy to see my old strategies if we're being honest. After destroying Faulkner, I am able to get the Mystery Egg from a guy at the Pokemart, allowing me to progress south of Route 32. Keeping Macargo in the party for this is actually pretty smart, since I need to get High Friendship to evolve, so we want it to get it hatched ASAP. There's also a few things we can do now that we're on Route 32, such as grab the Old Rod right before the Union Cave, so we'll want to revisit a few locations, those being the Ruins of Alf for a Magikarp and Poliwag, Tentacool on Route 32, and two Krabby over in Cherry Grove City, since we'll need one for a trade much later. Right after, the egg hatched into Togepi, so there's nothing else left to do other than go into Union Cave. There's not much here other than Sandshrew, which is only here in Heart Gold, as well as a few trainers. So afterwards, I emerged in Azalea Town, opening up the first Team Rocket confrontation. Fortunately, the Slowpoke well has just that, Slowpoke. After grabbing it and destroying everyone in the cave, I made sure to go back to the Union Cave to grab myself a Goldeen with the Old Rod, leaving only one area we can really go to for the time being, the Ilex Forest. There's only two available Pokemon here for now, those being Paris and two Oddish. But there's also something else. Normally you'd need Cut to progress, which you can't use until you beat Bugsy, so I'm sure you're thinking, oh perfect, now just grind and continue. Nope, not at all. The only thing I can do now is grind Slowpoke, because it can learn Headbutt before we can access the guy that teaches it. Yep. The thing you normally get after cutting cut! So now we've got more Pokemon to capture with the Headbutt trees. So after getting it to level 25, I started hunting, getting Pineco here in the Ilex Forest, and a party of Apom in Zalia Town since it has Pickup, which we will need to make this challenge a lot easier. I decided to forego the other tree encounters for the time being, since none of them can evolve in this section, so we need to get our Apom to level 21 first so that we can get a pickup squad going, since we need rare candies in order to make the rest of this run a little bit more trivial. However, I actually raised all four of them to level 41, one of which I allowed to evolve into Ambipom for the dex total, but this will really help with getting a ton of rare candies and giving me a higher chance of getting sunstones that I need as well as moonstones for the future. 
Shortly after, I evolved Slowpoke into Slowbro at level 37, and then decided to go after the remaining encounters. I found Execute on Route 32, and Heracross on Route 46, so now I'm relieved of encounters, leaving just grinding. Mind you though, I've already done a ton of grinding getting 5 things to an average of level 40, so I've already been driven crazy, but what's a little bit more grinding gonna do? Woohoohoo! Everything. Literally everything. Well, I just evolved everything else. Tentacool into Tentacruel at level 30, Poliwag into Poliwhirl at level 25, Magikarp into Gyarados at level 20, Pineco into Fortress at level 31, Paris into Parasect at level 24, Goldeen into Sea King at level 33, Krabby into Kingler at level 28, Togepi into Togetic at level 10 with max happiness, Sandshrew into Sandslash at level 22, Oddish into Gloom at level 21, and into Blossom of the Sunstone that I managed to get with Pickup. Somehow I only got two Sunstones while going through that grinding. So I'm glad I got all four of them to level 41, or else I probably wasn't even going to get even one of them. And with a time of 135 hours and 53 minutes... <laughs> yeah, that's how long it took. But you know what? I think you'll notice how much it really improves the time throughout. After whipping Bugsy's bum, I ran through the Ilex Forest and arrived at the other side on Route 34, where I'm able to capture an Abra, two Drowsy, and a very important Pokémon for this section, Ditto, since we have a lot of breeding to do, but not quite yet. There's one person on this route we need to get the number from, and that's Picnicker Gina, since she's able to give me a Leaf Stone, something I will need several of for this section of the game. Goldenrod City's next on the agenda, since there's two Pokemon we need to get immediately through the game corner. After getting a bit ahead of myself, since I enjoy Voltorb Flip, though I managed to grab Dratini for 2100 coins. Yeah, we have to evolve that on very, very low level wild Pokemon. Now are you understanding why I got those level 41 APOMs? I also grabbed an Ekans, since this is the earliest we can get an Inheart Gold but Soul Silver will get Sandshrew to make up for the version exclusives of the last section. I grabbed the bike, fought the trainers in the underground area, finally getting to the in-game trade inside of the department store, trading my spare Drowsy for a Machop. And with that, I finally got to Route 35, which has three important encounters, but I'm skipping those for now since I want to take out the trainers here and in the National Park, where I made sure to grab a Sunkern, evolving it into Sunflora with the other Sunstone I got in the last section. I was super close to evolving Dratini during this part, so I went ahead and did some grinding in the National Park to evolve before doing the bug catching contest. You see, this is held every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and there's a ton of exclusive bug Pokemon that aren't found here normally. And since I'm playing Heart Gold, I need Venonat, the Weedle line, Scyther, and Pinsir. Sadly though, I can only keep one Pokemon that I catch, and that's the one I enter into the competition. So I opted to just catch everything and toss them away, keeping only Venonat, since Venomoth is uncatchable here, whereas Weedle, Kakuna, and Beedrill all are, but I can't keep them, but they're registered in the Pokedex, so it's all good. This is the same in Soul Silver, except with the Caterpie line. My first encounter was Beedrill, which I managed to catch, so I was pretty happy already. Then I proceeded to get Weedle and Venonat, which I made sure not to toss away for other Pokemon. And lastly, I managed to get Kakuna, Scyther, and Pinsir, getting me all the entries I need for this area. I'm actually surprised I managed to do this in one try, since I really didn't want to wait until the next date of the contest. I didn't get the prize, which would have been a Sunstone, but I don't need it thanks to my overpowered pickup squad. I took out the remaining trainers on the other side of the route, including this one, School Kid Allen. He can give you a Firestone, which we'll need for this section. That's two trainers that we have to get phone calls from for stones in the section. Three from Gina and one from Alan. Before leaving though, I grabbed a Growlithe, or Fulpix if you're playing Soul Silver, as well as a Stantler, leaving only Route 35's encounters. After grabbing both Ninorans, I attempted to find Yanma, which is a 1% encounter. And this one took me over an hour to find, but I managed to get it while also grinding up Dragonair quite a bit. This just leaves grinding and getting the two trainers to call me to give me the stones. This actually wasn't too painful, since all I had to do was grind up everything and wait for those two to call me while I'm grinding. 
I occasionally got calls in between battles, but I literally grinded up everything, including getting the two moonstones I needed via pickup, and I still didn't have all the stones. Though, through the grinding, I managed to evolve Nidoran into Nidorino at level 16, Nidoran into Nidorina also at level 16, Dragonair into Dragonite at level 55, Drowsy into Hypno at level 26, Venonat into Venomoth at level 31, Abra into Kadabra at level 16, Machop into Machoke at level 28, Ekans into Arbok at level 22, Yanma into Yanmega at level 33 while knowing Ancient Power, Nidorino into Nidoking with a Moonstone, and Nidorina into Nidoqueen with a Moonstone. So, the calls. Literally, you just leave the game on until they call and give you the items. You can save scum, so you can save the game, wait an hour if you don't get the calls, soft reset, and wait another hour. It works, that's what I did, but it is still stupid because you have to pay attention to the game while just waiting there. So, after dealing with that, I managed to get myself Growlithe into Arcanine with a Firestone, Gloom into Vileplume with a Leaf Stone, since I had grinded the second Oddish during the grind of this section, Weepin' Bell into Victory Bell with a Leaf Stone, and Execute and Executor also with a Leaf Stone. And with a total of 103 Pokemon in a time of... something... I don't know because apparently I forgot to record the bottom screen at the time, allowing me to fight Whitney. She does the whole crying thing, but gives me the badge, allowing me to move onward. After getting the badge, though, the Poke Athlon Dome opens up, which fortunately means I don't have to rely on stupid phone calls for Evolution Stones, and that makes me so happy. You don't realize how actually frustrating it is to wait for these things to happen when you're trying to go fast in the first place. And fortunately, I love the Poke Athlon Dome minigames, so I grinded out enough points to get a few stones, since we need one Firestone, four Water Stones, and a Thunderstone. Sadly, though, each item can be only purchased once a day, and since the stones only come around once per week, there's a little bit of a wait of, like, a month to get everything. It's kind of frustrating, but it's not the first time that this happens. Luckily, I did enough grinding to grab both a Water Stone on Wednesday and a Thunder Stone on Thursday, so I just grabbed the Squirt Bottle and moved on to the tree that happens to be a pseudo -Wudo. Fortunately, Pickup has been really nice to me, so I have quite a few Ultra Balls for capturing. Though, I will be saving the rest for some very difficult Pokemon in this section. Once I got to Ecritik City, I made sure to send Bill back to Goldenrod so that I could get a Gift Pokemon later on, as well as evolving Poliwhirl into Poliwrath with a Water Stone that I got from my first Pokeathlon grind. I'll be grabbing that gift later, for now I want to go into the Burn Tower, since there's two Pokemon I need, one of which needs to be bred, those being Coughing and Magmar. Oh yeah, there's Entei, Suicune, and Raikou. Yeah. We have to go get both Entei and Raikou in this section. Without a Master Ball. Yikes. Anyway, after dealing with that, I made sure to go back to Goldenrod and grab the Gift Eevee so that I could breed for four more of them, evolving one of them into Jolteon with the Thunderstone that I grabbed earlier. I then threw it in with my Ditto, getting four eggs before switching it out for Magmar, getting an egg before putting everything away and hatching the Eevees and a single Magby. I kept two of the Eevees in my party since I needed to make sure that they got max happiness, especially since I needed to grind my Haunter to level 39 in order to use it for hunting for Entei and Raikou. I made sure to use some rare candies after getting it to a high enough level to warrant usage of them, then started biking back and forth and using the Repel trick. Not gonna lie, it only took about 10 minutes to find Raikou after that grind, and since I made sure my moveset was Hypnosis, Mean Look, Dream Eater, and Nightshade, made it quite easy to damage it. After weakening it and making sure it was put to sleep, on the third encounter of it I managed to get it in an Ultra Ball. One down, one to go. Entei took a little bit longer to get, taking four encounters before I managed to snag it. Glad I put the time investment into getting Haunter to level up, or else that would have been a nightmare. I took a break from the challenge for about a week, getting enough points to get myself a Firestone and a second Waterstone to evolve Eevee into Flareon and another into Vaporeon, using them respectively. I figured now was a good time to go west towards Route 38 to grab Miltank, Magnemite, Farfetch'd, Tauros, and a 1% Snubble, which actually only took about 15 minutes. Thank the lord I didn't have to deal with another situation of Yanma. If you're playing Soul Silver, you'll also grab Meowth, but we'll be grabbing our version exclusive soon. After arriving in Olivine City, I grabbed the Good Rod from a Fisherman, allowing me to do some backtracking, 
grabbing Quillfish on Route 32, which wasn't too bad even though it was a 2% encounter, and Shelter and Shinshu from New Bark Town. Luckily, we can take a shortcut from Violet City back over to Ekritik, but instead of moving west, I made sure to move east in order to go to Mount Mortar. Home of- Oh my god, that's a shiny Machop! That wasn't what I was looking for, but that is certainly a nice addition to the collection. Instead, I was actually looking for Meryl, though I don't have to worry about the gender this time, since I can't get the incense for it. Not gonna lie, I'm not surprised I got a shiny in this run due to how many 1% and 2% encounters that I've had to capture so far in the run. Emerging on the other side, Route 42 is the home of Mankey only in Heart Gold, leaving me to skip over Mahogany Town and into Route 43, where I can get the last grass encounter for this section, Girafferig. At this point, I tried rare candying my Eevee into Espeon, which managed to work, so I reset and evolved it with EXP as to not waste one, putting it away and trading my extra Krabby for a Voltorb after going back to Olivine City. Olivine does actually have the last few fishing encounters of the section, one of which being Corsola during the day, so I decided to grind until nighttime occurred, evolving Meryl into Azumarill at level 18, Snubble into Granbull at level 23, Chinchu into Lantern at level 27, Mankey into Primeape at level 28, and Magnemite into Magneton at level 30 before catching Staryu in Olivine City at night, and evolving the other Eevee into Umbreon right after. I do admit that Pickup has been OP during this time, since I haven't had to train anything past level 25 before being able to use them, so after evolving Voltorb into Electrode at level 30, and evolving Coughing into Weezing at level 35, it's time to wait two weeks for the rest of the Waterstones. And with that, I'm able to get Cloyster, and Starmie, getting us to 139 Pokemon and a time of 170 hours and 20 minutes. So yeah, thanks Pickup and higher level wild Pokemon. Fun fact, both pre-badge 4 and both Pokemon Platinum and HeartGold Soul Silver is 139 Pokemon, for some reason. I'm sure that's not intentional, but that's really consistent game design, which is great. So this is where some screwy stuff happens. I actually transferred all of my data over to a new PC, since my old one was relatively prone to crashing, hence why most of my older videos had some sections of missing footage. Sadly though, this resulted in me in losing my save file somehow. I don't know how, it just happened. So I had to redo the, the entirety of the challenge up to this point. Frustrating, to be sure, but I used speed up to catch back up to where I was since there's no way I was going to deal with it again. And since I had the experience of a few other POCs by that point, I was able to reduce my time dramatically using a couple of new strats. First of all, I only did grinding at night for Ghastly, reducing my time from 65 hours in the first section all the way down to 42, using some better switch training strategies for those Pokemon that didn't have anything but normal type moves. Pre-Badge 2 was pretty similar, however I only trained one Ambipom to level 41 and the other three went to 31 and I made sure to grind exclusively using Headbutt Pokemon, making my average EXP yield more than double thanks to the wild Butterfree and Noctowl in the Ilex Forest, as opposed to grinding in the Union Cave like I did originally. Lastly, I grabbed Gina's number, but didn't continue until I got all the stones I needed for the section, since on the same route you can get Lyra's number, therefore clogging up who can call you, making it much slower than if you just backtrack to Exalia Town, and save scum for calls to save in-game time. Alan only had to call me once, so that wasn't a problem, and my rare candy distribution was better, being able to candy up Dragonair from the early 30s all the way up to 55, and saving the rest of them for later on. Overall, I'm much happier with this redone portion of the run, though I wish I didn't have to waste the time to do it. I ended up landing at Morty with a time of 119 hours and 34 minutes, saving a ton of time thanks to new strategies, and more knowledge of how POCs could be handled. Anyway, back to your regularly scheduled POC. Now that I have the Fog Badge from Morty, I can use Surf outside of battle, so I went back to Olivine City and over to Route 41, where I'm able to capture Mantine. But only in Heart Gold, Soul Silver gets nothing here. Other than that, there's nothing to do aside from getting to Sienwood City, where we can get a gift Shuckle and chase off Suicune to the next location. We'll be getting him much later on, trust me. And now it's time for another large divergence from the original Gold and Silver, and that's the cave leading to Route 47, a completely new area for Heart Gold and Soul Silver. There's a few new areas here along with some Pokemon you wouldn't catch in the originals, such as Steelix and Mistrevis in the Cliff Cave, and if you go down the ladder and outside, you can find Seal by surfing in the water. Last one before the Safari Zone on Route 48, I found Diglett, 
leaving just the Safari Zone and one other Pokemon. Fortunately, this area isn't dreadful yet until the post-game due to not having the National Dex, but I don't have the Area Changer unlocked yet, so I'm only able to capture from the original six areas laid out. So, Larvitar and Lickitung were in the Mountain area, Grimer while surfing in the Marshland area, Smurgle in the Plains area, Kangaskhan in the Wasteland area during the day, and Rhyhorn in the Savannah area during the day. From here I just did a bit of grinding, starting off with Larvitar and Seal, getting them to a high enough level to challenge all the trainers in this section, moving Suicune to the next location again, and even taking out the Team Rocket event in Mahogany Town just to burn time, evolving Larvitar into Pupitar at level 30 before Bauba called me to get the Area Changer. This gave me access to the rest of the Safari Zone areas, so I swapped them out, capturing Cubone in the desert during the day, Doduo in the grass, and Lapras while surfing on the rocky beach, Jigglypuff and Murkrow in the swamp, Mr. Mime during the day in the forest, Golduck and Psyduck in the wetlands grass at night, Clefairy in the meadow at night, and Wobbuffet in the peak area at night. And with that, we only have one more Pokemon to capture with this section, but we have to backtrack all the way back to the ruins of Alf, taking the path through Union Cave to access the grass, capturing a Natu to finish up the captures for this section. By this point, though, I've already ran out of trainers to battle since I ran through all of them with Pupitar and Seal. However, the grass right outside of Safari Zone on Route 48 has some great things to train against, such as Tauros, which can yield around 600 EXP per fight, along with other evolved Pokémon like Fero, and higher than normal EXP yields from the likes of Diglett. This made grinding a breeze and matched with my leftover rare candies that I made sure to save for Pupitar and Rhyhorn to make this section shorter, and went relatively well especially when I made sure to backtrack to Mr. Pokemon's house to get the EXP share in exchange of the red scale, making grinding those that didn't have very good attacks or no attacks at all, aka not to, really easy. Overall, I evolved Seal into Dugong at level 34, Clefairy into Clefable with a Moonstone, Jigglypuff into Wigglytuff also with a Moonstone, Natu into Zatu at level 25, Pupitar into Tyranitar at level 55, Diglett into Dugtrio at level 26, Rhyhorn into Rhydon at level 42, Grimer into Muck at level 38, Lickitung into Licky Licky at level 30 while well knowing Rollout, Doduo into Dodrio at level 31, and Cubone into Marowak at level 28. Lastly, we have to make sure to breed Clefable and Wigglytuff in order to get Cleffa and Iglybuff respectively. And this gives us a total of 176 Pokemon and the most I can have with 4 badges. So, from here we can either fight Chuck, Jasmine, or Price at this point, but we're going to want to fight Price to get access to Whirlpool outside of battle. So, I saved in front of him with a time of 133 hours and 52 minutes. Not a bad section at all, only a bit over 14 hours. After crushing Price's team and putting them in my glass of water to get a nice, refreshing beverage... Ah, <sighs> that's nice. I made sure to head over to the Whirl Islands, since there's only two Pokemon available in this section, those being Horsey, and after grinding it up a few levels over in the Cliff Cave next to Sianwood City, since there's a ton of Onyx and Steelix to take on amongst other things, getting me a Seedra at level 32, giving me a total of 178 Pokemon, and the most I can have with only 5 badges. With this section done though, I have to fight both Chuck and Jasmine, since I can't move past Mahogany Town, unless I beat them and take out the rocket event in the radio tower. Unfortunately, having to waste the experience from them rather than to be able to fight them all with the Pokemon that I'll be catching from this section. Good thing this section is pretty short, though. Once I'm able to move past Mahogany, I moved on over to Route 44, where I made sure to capture Remoraid by fishing, and using the trainers on the route to level it up to level 25, evolving it into Octillery right before catching Tangela. There's nothing left on this route, so the next place on the agenda is the Ice Path, where I'm able to capture Jinx, Swinub, grabbing the HM for Waterfall, and if you're playing Soul Silver, you'll grab a Deli Bird. I hate that thing. Moving on. There's no trainers in here, so I just moseyed my way on out to Blackthorn City, getting straight into the gym since I want that precious Gym Trainer EXP to level up Tangela. Unfortunately, nothing evolves in here due to a lack of trainers, but there is one more place for me to catch Pokemon and to grind in, that being Route 45. Here I'm able to capture a Gligar and Fanpy, though Soul Silver players will be getting Teddy Ursa and Skarmory instead. 
And lucky you, you don't have to deal with getting a Razor Fang for Gligar later on in this game. <sighs> the torture that I put myself through for you guys. Anyway, I made sure to have a flying Pokemon in my party, and I just kept going through Route 45, fighting all of the trainers I could, barely missing Tangela's evolution by about a level. So I brought it up to level 32, giving it a rare candy to evolve into Tangrowth at level 33 while knowing Ancient Power. The last two Pokemon to grind are Fanpy and Swinup. So I put both of my party and just used the EXP share for the less competent one, which tended to be swine up most of the time due to getting KO'd by the Gravelers on the route, since it really wasn't strong enough to hit for massive damage. Either way, after about an hour and 40 minutes, Fanpy evolved into Donphan at level 25, swine up into Pile of Swine at level 33, and with a heart scale that I got from Pickup, I went to the Move Relearner to teach Pile of Swine Ancient Power, evolving it in one level into Mamo Swine. That's all the grinding, however, there's still one more Pokemon in this section. Putting Jinx in the daycare with Ditto will result in an egg, and once hatched, I'm able to add Smoochum to the total, giving me a time of 138 hours and 31 minutes, with a total of 190 Pokemon, the most you can have with 7 batches. Now, technically, you could have given me slack and allowed me to fight Claire for EXP due to her not actually giving you the badge until you complete the quiz in the Dragon's Den, but I'd figure I'd keep it simple, since this is a special case. Only a few more Pokémon, until I can challenge the Elite Four, so let's take care of them. Professor Elm called me and decided to give me a Master Ball, which I'm sure will be handy in the future. Though, it doesn't seem like anyone's looking good in here. Is everybody alright? You look disfigured. However, now that we have access to Waterfall, I'm able to travel into Mount Mortar and into the back of the cave to find a Black Belt who gives me a Tyroat. Fortunately, I got a neutral nature on my first try, so it'll be easy to evolve. So I just grinded it up into Hitmontop at level 20, since I can't breed it until it's evolved. Two more eggs later, and we've got the rest of the Tyrogues we need for its evolutions. However, it's gonna be a little bit of a pain to get these in the current state, so I went to the Goldenrod department store and grabbed myself a few proteins and irons, so that after grinding, I could evolve my Tyrogues into Hitmonlee with higher attack at level 20, and into Hitmonchan with higher defense, also at level 20. I use the Kimono Girls as well as Route 45 again for those, since being only evolving at level 20, it really wasn't that big of a deal. Alright, one more thing in Johto before I'm able to take my first steps into Kanto in this challenge. Now that I have both the Rainbow Wing and the Clear Bell, it's time to go up into the Bell Tower and challenge Ho-Oh. Ho is actually quite a powerful Pokemon, hence why I brought along Raikou in an attempt to paralyze the first thing which I managed to do on the first go-around, but of course I got a critical hit on the second attack. Whoopsie! Second round went much better though, getting plenty of damage off, though my attempt to put it to sleep with Haunter didn't work. So I just started chucking balls, somehow getting it in within five balls. Dang, I didn't expect it to go that well. Hopefully that luck stays throughout the rest of the run. After stuffing the big bird in my PC, I'm able to head back to Newbark Town and surf to the right to arrive in Kanto, where I'm able to capture the last Pokemon of this section, Ponyta. And guess what? There's just enough trainers between here and Victory Road for Ponyta to get very close to evolving. So I went in and got it to level 38, using my last two rare candies to get it to level 40 and evolve it into Rapidash. One rival battle later and it's time to fight the Elite Four with a total of 197 Pokemon, and the most you can have before the post game. I also got to this point in 141 hours flat, so I'm quite happy with that. The Elite Four fell like flies, finally allowing me to claim the rightful title of champion, and now it's time for the post game. Oh lord, the post game. So, in short, this section has over 150 new Pokemon for me to capture, ranging from the Safari Zone, Hoenn and Sinnoh Sound, Swarms, and just new Pokemon that are around Kanto. I'm going to try to be brief as to not keep you for over an hour, but it's still going to be a lot, so strap in. After getting the SS ticket to allow me to get to Vermilion City, I boarded the ship getting a call from Bauba about object placement in the Safari Zone. I'm going to attempt to explain this the best that I can, but it's quite an ordeal. When you rearrange the areas of the Safari Zone for every 10 days that an area is active as one of the six areas placed, it will get leveled up by one of its attributes, those being Peak, forest, waterside, and plains. Once an object's placed, it'll give one point to that attribute, but when an area levels up, it'll multiply said effect. Such as if I left an area here for 10 days, the plains attribute would hit level 2, 
then 20 days would do the same for forest, then peak with 30, 40 with waterside, and so on until everything hits level 4 at 130 days. Fortunately, we don't need 130 days to get everything. Unfortunately, we still need 100 days to get a certain Pokemon in the rocky beach. This is why I wanted to start this as early as possible, since I can do literally everything else in the game, including Swarms, Owen and Sinnoh Sound, Battle Frontier BP for Gligar, and in the future, Sneasel, anything aside from this. So, I started off making sure that the Rocky Beach, Wetland, and Meadow were set up, since they'll need to be here for the longest amount of time, 100 days, and 70 for the Wetland and Meadows. The other three areas are what I'm going to be switching out so that I can get everything else within that 100 day period. So I placed the Peak, Savannah, and Wasteland to start off, since we can get some stuff on the first day with objects. Another thing though is that we can't get every object instantly, and with my luck I only started off with the forest objects, allowing me to only capture Nuzleaf in the meadows with 28 forest objects, Manectric in the rocky beach with 10 forest objects, Badoo in the rocky beach with 18 forest objects, and Pachirisu in the wetland with 8 forest objects. After withdrawing Nuzleaf and Manectric from the PC, I evolved Nuzleaf into Shiftry with a Leaf Stone that I managed to get from a call from Gina about earlier during an earlier section, bypassing the need for grinding points in the Pokeathlon, as well as breeding both it and Manectric so that I could hatch Seedot and Electrike respectively. With that out of the way, I grabbed Badoo since it evolves by happiness, and flew back over to Kanto, seeing that one of the swarms activated. This changes every day, but if you tune into Pokemon Talk on the Pokegear, you'll be able to learn what Pokemon is swarming in a specific area, and this time it just so happens to be located in the Viridian Forest. I can't quite get over there yet thanks to the blockage of Snorlax in front of the Diglett's Cave, so I went over to Cerulean City to head east towards Route 9, eventually landing in front of the power plant where I made sure to catch Electabuzz before getting the machine part back, which completes the side quests and allows me to get the expansion card in Lavender Town so that I can get the Poke Flute channel and wake up and capture Snorlax, opening up Diglett's Cave and pushing me over to Route 2, where I can easily access the Viridian Forest in order to capture Pikachu and Krikatot thanks to the Swarm. I'm going to compile the Swarms at the end of the section for ease, just know that I'm looking out for them during each day that I'm waiting on the Safari Zone and completing other tasks. I went north to Pewter to grab the Silverwing from a random old man who has it for some reason, opening up a legendary for us to catch, but I'm gonna hold off for a bit. Instead, I opted to go to Celadon City since it's time for some more Voltorb Flip! I need 9,999 coins for Porygon, which only took a few rounds since I love this game and I wish they'd bring it back and I'm good at it. I grabbed the Porygon and moved out, going back to Pewter and opening up both Pallet and Cinnabar for flying but most importantly, heading to the Seafone Islands to capture one thing. On the way though, I made sure to grab the Water Stone here, since I don't want to have to grind for it in the Pokeathlon. Also, I guess Red canonically skipped out on catching the legendary birds, allowing me to snag Articuno in about 10 minutes. I figured with one legendary down, we may as well grab the other for the section, so I headed over to the Whirl Islands and into the deepest chamber to encounter Lugia. After a few resets, since it's quite a high level for what I have, I managed to catch it in about 20 Ultra Balls. Since I'm in Johto right now, I figured I could go to the Ruins of Alf and use Rock Smash, since here I can get an Old Amber, and in Heart Gold a Helix Fossil. You would get the Dome Fossil in Soul Silver, and then over in Cliff Cave I can get the Claw Fossil, or Root Fossil in Soul Silver. Bringing them back to Pewter City allows me to revive them into Aerodactyl, Ammonite, and Anorith respectively. There's also a few random wild Pokemon that are here in Kanto that I can't get anywhere else, so I made sure to go around the region and get them, those being Houndour on Route 7 and Chansey on Route 15. Chansey can be a pain to encounter, so I recommend grabbing Graveler from your PC and using it to repel trick it out. During that search, I got another call from Balba, letting me know that I have more objects available, this time giving me more useless objects, but I also got the peak objects, giving me more Pokemon to capture, including Auron on the rocky beach with 24 peak objects, and Skaroopy in the wasteland with 28 peak objects. I actually had a few rare candies lying around thanks to Pickup, managing to use three of them to evolve Auron into Laron and into Agron, as well as Skaroopy into Drapion. I figured now would be a good time to do a bit of breeding as well, since I need two more types of objects from Balba. So, I made sure to breed Pikachu and Electabuzz so I could get Pichu and Elekid respectively. 
There's also quite a few stones that we need to get for this section, aside from the extra leaf stone I got. I need a dawn stone, thunder stone, two dusk stones, and two shiny stones for the rest of the challenge. And with everything aside from the Thunderstone costing 3,000 points rather than just 2,500, I needed to get to work. I'm just going to recommend now going through the power course using Nidoking, Nidoqueen, and Entei to get quick and easy points is the best option, since it's pretty easy to rack up between 500 and 600 points every round, making it go by quite quickly. I got the Dawn and Dusk Stones on the first go around, using the Dusk Stone to evolve Mischievous into Miss Magius but I still need another one for Murkrow. Sadly though, again, Pokeathon only allows you to get one item per day, so I can't get it right now. However, once I came back to the game, the Thunder, Dusk, and Shiny Stones were all there, so I did another chunk of grinding, got all of them, evolving Togetic into Togekiss with the Shiny Stone, Murkrow and Honchkrow with the Dusk Stone, and Pikachu into Raichu with the Thunder Stone. Perfect, time to move on for the time being since I can't get the last Shiny Stone until later. I figured Balba's gonna call again soon, so I grabbed a few Pokemon to grind and flew back to the Safari Zone, grinding Cricketot in the grass on Route 48 for a few minutes to evolve into Cricketune. Sure enough, I came back and got the Water Side Objects, which allowed me to capture Corefish while fishing in the rocky beach with 15 Water Objects, and Azuril in the Savannah with 5 Water Objects. Only one more to wait for, so I decided since it was Sunday, I'd go do the bug catching contest, since there's a lot of new Pokemon that I can get now that I have the national decks. They're split up over the course of Sunday and Thursday, so on Sunday I could only capture Wormpole, Cascoon, Illamise, Beautyfly, and Nincata. I kept Nincata since it was the only one where its evolutions aren't catchable. Before I leveled it up though, I made sure that I had a singular Pokeball in my inventory, since I know in this generation you can only get Shedinja if it's specifically a Pokeball, nothing else. So after leveling it up once, Ninkata evolved into Ninjask and split off into Shedinja. I have enough stuff to grind up to a pretty high level right now, so I made sure I grabbed a few Pokemon and just started running around Kanto, taking out every trainer in sight, including the gym trainers from several gyms, allowing me to get Houndour into Houndoom at level 24, and Ammonite into Amistar at level 40. At this point, I got the last call I needed from Baba, getting the last few objects for the Safari Zone, those being the Plains objects. So it's time to catch the last few Pokemon of the Safari Zone for the time being. Lombre can be found in the Wetland with 14 Plains objects, as can Surskit with only 6, Linoon in the Peak with 5 Plains objects, Zangoose also in the Peak with 12 Plains objects, Zigzagoon in the Savannah with 10 Plains objects, and Luxio also in the Savannah with 24 Plains objects. Not bad, now to wait 20 days to get an extra single Pokemon. Actually, it's breeding time. After evolving Lombre into Ludicolo with the Water Stone I got from the Seafoam Islands, I bred it as well as Luxio so that I could hatch both a Lotad and Shinx. I also realized that I completely forgot to go around the region to find rare candies that are either hidden or unobtainable without certain HMs, so I grabbed one in Violet City in order to evolve Luxio into Luxray, and the one on Route 34 to evolve Surskit into Masquerain. There's not really much left for me to do that isn't reliant on time, but one of those things is headbutt trees. The first of which is on Route 2, south of Pewter City, where I'm able to grab Starly. You can also grab Wormpole here if you want to try to evolve it, but I'd much rather leave it for the budge catching contest. I decided to just run over Route 25 rather than flying, taking out the trainers on Route 3, evolving Starly into Staravia at level 14, and fighting my rival in Mount Moon for the final time, taking out his Gengar with my Staravia, barely missing the evolution. So I just fought one more person on Route 4 to evolve it into Star Raptor at level 34. Route 25 is next, where I'm able to get myself a Slack Off as well as a female Combi. I also got Misty to go back to her gym, so I took down her gym trainers and continued running around with Anorith and Slack Off, evolving Anorith on the cycling road into Armaldo at level 40 and slack off into Vidoroth at level 18. Lastly, over in Viridian Forest, I am able to get a Shroomish, finishing off the headbutt trees for this action. I continued south, evolving Vigoroth into slacking at level 36 on Route 21, as well as Combi into Vespiquen at level 21. I also tried my friendship evolutions here, managing to evolve Chansey into Blissey, though Badoo won't evolve unless it's daytime, so I held out on it. I continued on to Route 20, leveling up Shroomish to evolve into Breloom at level 23. With all those out of the way, I flew to Vermilion City to grab the Luck Incense, since we needed to breed Blissey, 
eventually hatching a Happini to finish off the evolution chain. <sighs> Alright, I guess we need to get this one out of the way. It's time for the Battle Frontier. I need 96 BP to get both a Razor Claw and a Razor Fang for the challenge, since we'll be getting Sneasel in the last section of the challenge, so we may as well just get everything now. I decided that the Battle Hall was going to be the fastest place to get BP. Every battle is a one-on-one -on -one battle, and 10 battles gets you 1 BP to start out, going up slowly as you pass through. Though it starts going up quite a bit once you get the Silver Print from the Frontier Brain with a streak of 50 wins. I brought Dragonite along since I figured, even though it's quad weak to ice types, I'm able to take them out since they're pretty frail, and dragon types just went down immediately anyway due to it outspeeding, and that it didn't matter. I also had Surf for ground, rock, and fire types, as well as return for anything else that I needed to hit for neutral damage. Admittedly, I should have put something like Fly on it so that in case I ran into a Shedinja, I wouldn't just die immediately, which did happen once to me. I failed a few times on the silver print battle, but the first time I got past it, I managed to get all the way to the gold print and win, giving me more than enough BP to get both items into progress. I'll admit, I never won a gold print from a battle frontier in this game, so it was kinda stressful to me, so I'm glad I finally managed to do it. There's also yet another legendary for me to get during this section, so I grabbed Gligar and finished the copycat side quest, giving me access to Steven who tells me that Latios is roaming around. I used routes 24 and 25 to go back and forth, managing to find Latias within about 10 minutes using the Repel trick, using the Master Ball on it since it's the last roaming legendary of the challenge. Tired of this section yet? Well, let's speed it up then. I booted the game back up on Thursday, giving me access to another bug catching contest. So I went there and captured Dustox, Silcoon, and Volbeat. And since it's Thursday, I can also access the Sinnoh sound on the Pokegear. If you tune into Pokemon music on Thursdays, they'll be playing Sinnoh Sound, therefore attracting new wild Pokemon in certain areas. The downside is, is that you have to turn it on after every battle, but you'll usually get them to encounter you pretty quickly, so it's not that big of a deal. With this, I'm able to get Metatype and Chatot from the Burn Tower, Weasel and Bidoof on Route 25, Bronzor and Chingling in the Victory Road, and Carnivine in the Ilex Forest. They're all available in a wide variety of areas, I just chose the most accessible places that had the highest levels for stuff that needed to evolve. Alright, time to start grouping things together for my sake, or else this is going to go on forever. The first of which I'll be going over are the swarms. Over the 100 days of waiting for the Safari Zone, I managed to capture Poochiana on Route 1, Sableye on Route 9, you get Mawile and Soul Silver, Wingull in Vermilion City, Baneri on Route 25, Swablu on Route 45, two Ralts on Route 34, one of which being male, Whiskash while fishing with the Super Rod in Violet City, Love Disc on Route 27, Relicanth on Route 12, Glam Pearl on Route 19, and Ball Toy on Route 3, or Gulpin if you were playing Soul Silver. Next up are the Hoenn Sound encounters, which can only be found on Wednesday through using the same radio station as the Sinnoh Sound, allowing me to capture Spinda in the Burn Tower. Wismer on Route 45, Makihita and Absol on the Victory Road, Plusle and Minen on Route 46, and Numel and Spoink in the Ilex Forest. Last catches on the docket for the section are the remaining Safari Zone encounters. After 20 days, I can get Cacturn in the Savannah with 18 Forest Objects. In 30, I can get Torkoal in the Savannah with 18 Peak Objects and swap it for the Forest area as well as getting Soul Rock in the Wasteland area with 21 Peak Objects, swapping that for the Marshland, and 18 Peak Objects in the Meadow gets me Nose Pass. At 40 days, I can get Sfeel at the Peak with 18 Water Objects, swapping it for the Desert, where I can capture Hippopotas with 28 Peak Objects there, and some Viper in the Marshland with 18 Plains Objects. At 60 days, I can get Vibrava with 25 Forest Objects in the Desert, and Krogunk with 21 forest objects in the marshland. At 70 days, I can get Bayonet with 25 peak objects in the marshland, Shelgon with 21 peak objects in the wetland, Riolu with 10 forest and 14 peak objects in the meadow, Beldum with 21 peak objects in the forest, swapping it for the swamp, where I can find Duskull with 28 peak objects, switching it out again for the mountain to find Lunatone with 15 peak objects. 
Last, but certainly not least, at 100 days, at the rocky beach with 13 planes and 17 peak objects, I can finally get Gibble, finishing off the safari zone and the hardest part of the run. Breeding everything that I've caught so far that I need to resulted in me hatching Barboach, Cacnea, Bagon, Shuppet, and Trapinch, leaving just the grinding. I just ran everything through the Elite Four over and over again, having Dragonite and Lugia take hits as I switch train them with the EXP share, so that they get 75% EXP rather than just 50%, evolving Budu into Roselia with Happiness during the daytime, and into Roserade with a Shiny Stone that I grinded for during the waiting of the Safari Zone, Corefish into Cronaut at level 30, Sfeel into Celio at level 32, and into Walrein at level 44, Vibrava into Flygon at level 45, Krogunk into Toxicroak at level 37, Shogun into Salamence at level 50, Riolu into Lucario with Happiness during the daytime, Beldum into Matang at level 20, and into Metagross at level 45, Duskull into Dusclops at level 37, Gibble into Gabite at level 24, and into Garchomp at level 48, Poochiana into Mightyena at level 18, Wingull into Pelipper at level 25, Ralts into Curlia at level 20 and into Gallade with a Dawnstone, and the other Curlia into Gardevoir at level 30, Swablu into Artaria at level 35, Baltoy into Claydol at level 36, Veneri into Lopunny with max happiness at any time, Wismer into Loudred at level 20 and into Exploud at level 40, Numil into Camerupt at level 33, Spoink into Grumpig at level 32, Meditite into Medicham at level 37, Bidoof into Bee Barrel at level 15, Buizel into Floatzel at level 26, Bronzor into Bronzong at level 33, Hippopotas into Hippowdon at level 34, Makahita into Hariyama at level 24, and a Knight Chingling into Chimeko with max happiness, and Gligar into Gliscor while holding the Razor Fang and leveling up. With a total of 348 Pokemon, or 347 in full silver, and a time of 181 hours and 43 minutes, which by the way, the duration of this section was shorter than section 1, there was just a lot more to talk about, it's time to fight Misty. The only reason we fight Misty first is because once we beat her, we gain access to catching Suicune, the only Pokemon left before we get the rest of the Kanto badges. It only took around 15 Ultra Balls before I managed to snack it, leaving the decimation of all the Kanto Gym Leaders and leaving only two more sections for me to complete. Before we can take on Red though, there's a few things I have to do first. First of which, I have to grab the HM for Rock Climb from Professor Oak, which opens up a few more Headbutt Encounters, Legendaries, and Incenses for Breeding. The first Pokemon I went after was Zapdos, appearing outside of the Power Plant now that I have all 16 badges. After a reset and around 10 Ultra Balls, I managed to catch it. I'm now able to access Cerulean Cave as well, and you know what that means. Mewtwo's here, and this thing really doesn't like to stay in a ball, taking a reset and 25 Ultra Balls to capture it, leaving just Moltres. It's housed in Mount Silver, so I traveled over, making the area available to fly to, as well as going in and catching Moltres within literally a single Ultra Ball. Well, that's a good way to end the Legends off for this section. So, with that, it's time to hunt for the Headbutt Pokemon. The first of which is in Cherry Grove City, where I can surf off at the beach and use Rock Climb to get Talo. The National Park has another Rock Climb spot, where I'm able to get Cheruby. Lastly, Route 39 has a Rock Climb spot, leading to Route 38, and allowing me to catch a female and male Burmy, since they evolve into different Pokemon. Afterwards, I made sure to go around the regions to grab the incenses required for all of the breeding for this section, since all of them require Rock Climb to get. After giving everything the appropriate incenses and biking around like crazy, I hatched Why Not, Bonsley, Munchlax, Mantike, and Mime Jr., leaving just the grinding. Again, I did the same thing as the last section, running through the Elite Four with the same EXP share strategy in order to evolve Talo into Swellow at level 22, Female Burmy into Mothim at level 20, Male Burmy into Wormadam at level 20, and Cherubi into Cherim at level 25. With that, I waited until nighttime so I could capture Sneasel on the outside of Mount Silver, using a single rare candy to evolve it into Weavile while holding the Razor Claw. And with a time of 184 hours and 48 minutes, 
I am able to battle Red, basically sweeping him with Dragonite and Mewtwo, leaving just one more section of the challenge. After beating Red, I am able to travel back to Oak's Lab to get a Kanto starter, and if you're familiar with the levels of evolution for them, you'll know that Bulbasaur is the correct choice in a POC environment. The second starter we can get is over in Saffron City. In the Sylph Company building, I can talk to Steven and get a Hoenn starter. They all evolve at the same level, and since I chose Totodile and Bulbasaur, I figured I'd take Torchic in order to create balance, as all things should be. Oh yeah, and for some reason Mr. Pokemon has the blue orb in his little cabinet, which I brought over to Route 47, surfing and rock climbing over into the Embedded Tower, where I'm able to catch Kyogre. Groudon's here in Soul Silver, but I remember when I played this for the first time that I thought this was insanely sick. It only took 15 Ultra Balls, leaving just the starters to grind. And in two run-throughs of the Elite Four, I evolved Bulbasaur into Ivysaur at level 16, and into Venusaur at level 32, and Torchic into Combusken at level 16, and into Blaziken at level 36. Finally, with a time of 186 hours and 40 minutes and a total of 373 Pokémon, this is the most you can catch in a single copy of Pokémon Heart Gold, or 371 in Soul Silver, due to the lack of Mantine and Mantike. We could technically get 21 more Pokémon through the Pokéwalker, but again, I consider it a separate game. Good lord, it's finally done! I'm sure if you've been watching this channel within the past year, you've at least heard the HGSS POC when meme at least once. And you know what? The meme dies here. It dies here with a great run, a great video, and a first ever completion of the Heart Gold Professor Oaks Challenge according to the leaderboard that's pinned in the Professor Oak Challenge Discord server, link in the description. However, I definitely think this could have been done better. First of all, the organization of it all, especially in Pre-Badge 9 with all of the Safari Zone, Hoenn and Sinnoh Sound, and everything else. It could have been done a few hours faster if I had just made sure to do everything in groups, rather than jumping back and forth because of boredom, since I'll admit, this challenge did get boring at times. Most of those times were during the line grinds in the Pokeathlon, Wild Encounters in Section 1, and the Battle Frontier, but it's worth it, since this finally completes the trifecta of remakes so far. And you guys know, once the Diamond and Pearl remakes come out, that I'll be doing an Oak Challenge of those as well. But next week, I'm going to leave it a mystery since I don't even know what challenge I'm doing just yet. But I'll make sure you guys enjoy it. See you guys then. Thank you guys so much for watching the video. Seriously, this one, jeez, was over a year since I started working on it. Admittedly, I could have probably finished it a bit earlier, but I'm quite happy I waited and made sure it was done right. If you guys liked the video, make sure to subscribe, hit the like button, comment down below what POCs you want to see next, and ring the notification bell and click all so that you don't miss an upload. If you really enjoyed it and want to help support me making more content like this, click on that join button down below or join my Patreon in order to get access to videos early and so much more. Again, thank you for watching. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you guys next week.